Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, Energy 808, the cutting edge. And we're going to talk today about the recovering situation in Kauai with our guest, Mina Morita. Mina, wonderful to have you on the show. You're the perfect guest for this discussion. Aloha. Hi. <laughs> Aloha, Jay. Thanks for having me, and it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, you know, Kauai is always called the separate kingdom, right? And um, because we're so far removed from Oahu <laughs> and not going to take you that grid. You know, I, I went, one time I wanted to do uh, a movie actually called uh, Insula Drift with the proposition mm -hmm. that not not only Kauai, but all the islands were actually drifting away from each other. People didn't really understand that. Um, they thought, uh -huh. well, no, the islands don't drift. The islands are pretty much in the same place they used to be. But it was a conceptual idea. The idea is that, you know, socially, culturally, the islands each had their own style and personality, and they, they saw their relationship with the other islands maybe it's not as close as it used to be in the day of the steamers. You remember the steamers? <clears throat> or, in the day, or in the day when you could take an, an airline, you know, for 20 bucks. Uh, it's not that long ago. And, uh, or when you, when you had the prospect of Super Ferry, for, for example, until that dreadful day in the Willy Willy. But, but anyway, point, point is that um, the islands are not as close as they used to be, and that's why we have to check up on them. That's why we have to talk to you and find out what is going on in Kauai as well as the other islands. So, well, and, well, I, I, I think you know part of the concern is not only the um, islands themselves are becoming more insular, but also areas on the island becoming more regional, and you know definitely you see it politically on um, the Big Island with. East Hawaii and West Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, you you know, you have some real physical constraints on Maui, be between West Maui and and Central, especially Central Maui. Yeah. And, you know, always, always that isolation of East Maui, the, the Hana to Kaupo area. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, and the same thing is happening on Kauai. Um, you, you know, you have a kind of a North Shore... Um, divide from the west side of the island, and I think it's been exacerbated by um, uh, the April rains and, and again by the um, August uh, tropical storm lane uh, flooding, uh, where now the, the northern um, side of the island, part of it is isolated and only accessible by um, the convoy going in and out daily. Yeah, I agree with you absolutely. And what, what is remarkable about all that is that presumably we can communicate with each other person to person easier now than ever before in the world. And yet, you're right, the islands have become regional. There are parts of the islands that don't connect with other parts of the islands. If you go back to Maui in the days of uh, No Ka'oi and uh, Lucky Live Hawaii and all those those books and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the literature that developed around the way these islands, the way life on these islands took place, um, that was a lot closer. People were a lot closer to each other on the islands and among the islands. But, but some, yeah. something yeah. has changed. I think you put your finger on a, a really important sea change. Well, <clears throat> well I think— well, I, I think part of it is, you know, just the personal relations, relationships, you know, that, that um, kind of interpersonal contact, face-to-face, -face, whether it was um, through competition, you know, the, the different sports clubs yeah. on the island, yeah. getting that way, you know, certainly was more personalized than what you have now, and especially, you know, given the cost of living and many families having, you know, multiple jobs. Yeah, it's true. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's true. I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, had, I had the same. My wife and I went to uh, the Big Island uh, a couple months ago. Well, maybe more like one month ago. And we, we felt the yeah. same feeling um, that, you know, uh, Kealakekua was a long way from Waimea. And Waimea was a long right. way from Hilo and so forth. And, um, and the South Point was a long way from anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but you know, I think a friend told me a long, long time ago when we were talking about Lanai and all of the social, cultural, economic changes that were happening on Lanai. And he said, you know, basically there was a larger sense of community during the plantation time because, you know, unless it was the peak season, everybody was pretty much on the same schedule and you know, it wasn't a 24-7 operation. Um, people usually had the weekends off to spend with their family and within the community. And now we have a different economy, um, you know, with, with the visitor industry where it's basically 24-7. And so that common time to take off and participate either in their family or within their community has definitely changed um, how we interact with each other. Yeah, sure. And when you look back, the plantations, uh, you know, certainly there were quality of life issues on the plantations, but the plantations were a binding social platform for so many people. They had so much in common because they all, you know, lived on that platform. Uh, that platform right. doesn't exist anymore, and we're we're being taken yeah. in different directions now. Right, right, yep. So let's talk oh, about Kauai okay. for a minute. Let's talk about, you know, you guys had a flood there. We've had other weather since. But, you know, one thing that really interests me about looking at Kauai today with you is that, you know, we forget. We forget what happened. We forget about Iniki and Eva. We forget what happened before. We we. We move on into the future without really having a recollection of the past. And I think to fully understand this and connect the dots and see the sea change, I always use that term, uh, we have to remember mm -hmm. what happened before. So let's, let's refresh on, on the floods in Kauai, what, <laughs> only, what, 90 days ago, 120 days ago? Uh, what happened there, and, and how did you observe that? Um, I myself was affected, and um, I chose to be evacuated, and it was only when I was up in the air and I could see um, what was happening to the Hanalei River that I knew that my um, property wasn't going to be further affected. But what happened was, you know, it was just a deluge in April, and my understanding was there was this persistent um, huge um, rain cell, thunderstorm that was directly over the North Shore area of Kauai where, you know, you had record rainfalls um, within um, the North Shore area, especially, um, and in these areas, especially you know, especially as you go further towards the Hyena area, these river valleys are really narrow. And so the amount of rain that has come down in that area, um, bringing a lot of debris with it, you know, just clogged up streams, created barriers. Um, you know, in one instance in the Hanalei area, I, I, I think the high tides exacerbated the ability for the water to flow to the ocean, and again, backed up in Hanalei Town. Um, so, you know, in areas that usually have minimal flooding, you had, you know, three to four feet of water. Um, <laughs> I just, it, it just seems so long ago. Well, you know, the, th uh, the thing about it is but, you say three, four feet of water, and Certainly, we had plenty of water on the Big Island uh, with Lane. Um, that mm -hmm. is way more than these hurricanes deposit on the mainland, it seems like to me. Yeah. When we get, you know, 40 inches plus in 24 hours, that's serious rain. Uh, you never hear that much yeah. rain happening in, in the storms on the mainland. Um, and I right. guess that, and Yeah, go ahead. So, so I think, you know, a lot of it is, trying to understand these weather patterns because now we know, uh, you know, what we want. If we're going to be hit by these storms, we want them to move through quickly. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and how these shears and pressure systems affect the weather now, um, causing them to stall over the islands now. 
and how devastating that can be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, you know one one would think that the what do you call it the the governmental agencies, federal and state, that look over the weather for us would know the, mm -hmm. would, have, would have known these principles like forever. But we, I think we're all learning together. And your point a minute ago about the wind shear, that's an important mm -hmm. lesson. Uh, and you yeah. know, the, the fact that we had trades that were blowing it at, at some you know, regular rate um, during lane yeah. was a, an important factor for pushing rain, uh, lane to the south and getting it off mm -hmm. our back. Um, and I didn't know that before. I, I guess maybe other people did. Uh -huh. but I think in general, the public now knows the point you're making. The public now knows that wind shear is your friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, but I think, you know, the, on the other side that people have to understand, too, is the impact of climate change and the fact that we know that the occurrence of, of trade winds um, is diminishing. Yes. You know, so where we could count on the trade winds before, I, you know, the systems are changing where we can't now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think some people might, you know, hear about all these stuff. I was watching the tube last night, and uh, actually it was not. It was the New York Times weather report, which is actually a video weather report that you can catch on the New York Times, something like what you would see on the the weather segment of a, a local news channel, and um, they were talking about the uh, they were talking about the storms that were coming into the East Coast, into what is it, South yeah. Carolina, um, from well, off Africa, and um, right. ta talking about how that you know that was that that could be as much as a Category Four storm that's really dangerous, and um, uh -huh. it, it struck me that um, a few years ago. Uh, we didn't have this many storms, and that now we right. seem to have them all the time. Now, now one school of thought might be, well, we didn't know enough. We didn't have meteorologists with all these sophisticated computer tools and sensors out there, and you know all the all the ways they have of gaining data so they can mm -hmm. they can track these storms. But I'm not sure that's it. I I, I think these storms did not exist in the same uh, number a few years ago. I think it, I think it's easy to come to the logical, rational, data-driven conclusion that we have more storms now than we've had before, uh, and and in greater frequency and and greater and greater strength for that matter. You know, category four. Every time you look, is a category four. This didn't happen five years ago, and you know, I, I almost think that s some people, even in the meteorolo meteorological department. Uh, are reluctant to lay it at the at the at the at the doorstep of climate change, but it is to me. Right. I don't know how you feel, but to me, it is clearly and absolutely climate change. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, I I live along um, near the Hanalei River, and you know, back in um, nineteen ninety five. I went through 300-year storms in a period of 90 days, you know, and and some might say it, that that was pretty unusual, but basically we're getting 100-year storms every every year now, sometimes a couple times a year, and then you know this was supposed the April flooding was supposed to be a hundred-year flood, I, I mean a 500-year flood. You know, and that was in April, and then we get hit again uh, by the tropical storm Lane, and you know that's another beyond a hunt, you know what they might have categorized earlier as a um, maybe a 250 year flood. I, you know, it's just, it, it's crazy. It's going it's faster and faster. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Mina, when we come back, because Mina Morita, a former chair of the PUC, former legislator in energy, which means environment, too, uh, when we come back, I would like to talk about uh, what this teaches us for the future, what we can expect for the future in terms of frequency and extreme weather. Uh, and I'd like to look at, at least for a moment, uh, the Pacific Islands and Tahiti and all these uh, other places in the Pacific as, um, as you know, 
uh, tidings of the future, uh, canaries in the coal mm -hmm. mine, if you will, uh, right, right after this break. Yeah. We'll be right back with Mina okay. Morita. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring in the latest and what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me one o'clock on a Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Okay, we're back. We're live on Energy 808, The Cutting Edge, with Mina Morita. We're talking about the, uh, the, the flood recovery situation in Kauai. One more point of background we should cover, at least tangentially, uh, with respect to climate change is that, you know, Hawaii so far has been really lucky. We've had floods in Kauai, as we'll talk about. Uh, we've had floods in the Big Island, certainly. Um, we'll have more of that. And we'll and we all you know we, we are at the same time um, you know having the sea change of of, of sea level rise, and I want to add that we we've had a, a number of shows involving weather and resilience organizations of various kinds, federal, state, research, um, talk about the Pacific Islands, and a lot of the Pacific Islands are having serious trouble. Uh, because they're they're having sea level rise, their water tables are upset, uh, their their temperatures are higher, their food sources are uh, you know less reliable. And I heard today that uh, this is happening also in Tahiti in French Polynesia, where sea level rise is actually having an effect on French Polynesia. So um, how much time will it be before uh, these things you know home in on on Hawaii? And we have not only these floods, but not only the, you know, the gradual sea level rise, but other examples of the effects of, sea, of, of climate change right here to the point where it, is, it becomes a much more serious business for us. Nothing is going to stop it. And the, the world right now is not doing a whole lot to stop it. The United States is doing very little to stop it. Um, so it will be coming. And you can feel it. You can see it. You can touch it and taste it. So tell us about the experience in Kauai, Mina. You know, I think it's really difficult right now um, on the North Shore of Kauai because, you know, people are really thinking about um, long-range planning efforts and how do you build resiliency in the recovery process. And, you know, a major point, in fact, is the highway um, especially from the Hanalei area into um, Hyena. You know, there were some major landslides along the area, which caused, um, you know, the road to be restricted. Um, and you can only enter and exit that area through a convoy system while the contractors work on the road. And every time there is heavy rainfall, uh, you know, you see more erosion onto the road, and you also see parts of the road sort of slipping. So one of the uh, repairs that's going on right now is shoring up the road itself. And, you know, we have to remember Kauai is one of the older major islands, and, and we are eroding. And, and so... There's a lot of community talk about how do we approach this recovery and um, understanding that these kinds of weather events is probably the norm now and how do we respond to that and, and build the agency of the community in, in that recovery effort. Um, 
you know, and part of that is having these homes built to um, new flood standards, and and so building these homes higher, which have higher costs, mm -hmm. and if the um, repair or the rebuild of these damaged homes are over ten thousand um, dollars, these homes are on cesspools. They have to. Um, convert to septic system. Um, you know, how do these septic systems function uh, with more flood occurrence? Uh, and, you know, basically, what does all that add to the cost of building and repairing your homes? Um, well, I, get, I get two things. I get two things out of that. Maybe you could comment on. The first thing is um, you can't go home again. Uh, and what I mean by that is you cannot okay. assume that you're going to fix your house uh, to make it like it was. Because if you do that, right. you're taking a serious risk the next time. So what you have yeah. to do as a lesson we can learn by what happened in Kauai, and for that matter, the Big Island and in the storms to come, is you have to fix your home in a way that it's stronger and more resilient going forward. You have to keep up yeah. with the increasing intensity of these, these storms and floods. That's one point. And right. the, the, other point is that, the other point is that that costs money, just as the roads cost money to fix them. And so we, we have to sort of be ready to raise that money and to dedicate that money uh, to dealing with, you know, making our homes more resilient and, and rebuilding the roads as and when necessary. This is the new normal, just as you said. Right, and then, you know, the other thing that we have to understand, especially in these um, uh, valleys which have been ca carved by rainfall, you know, from these two uh, major flooding events, the water patterns have changed. So the need for hydrological studies, so we understand the drainage system, so we don't put anybody back in harm's way. Mm -hmm. um, and. And so that's from the, the, the government, um, you know, having more robust planning efforts as we move forward. And then on the individual end, uh, you know, people understanding their responsibility to be able to um, rebuild in a way that makes them less vulnerable and to be more vigilant. Uh, you know, in the April flood, I think we inventory something like 297 vehicles that were lost and you mean um, swept away damaged by flooding mm -hmm. yeah whether they were you know in garages that were susceptible to flooding or on the roads that were susceptible to flooding or even like you said swept away um, it, you know, and, and tons of farm equipment, you know, especially for the far, tar taro farmers. But, you know, there's a need to be vigilant and be ready to move things to higher ground um, and identifying uh, where you can move equipment and vehicle to higher ground so they won't be effect affected by flood waters. Yeah. And, and part of this is part of re re recovering. Uh, is to have insurance, and everybody says, I mean, we've had a number of people on the show, so you want to prepare for the storms of the future, you better get flood insurance. On the other hand, yeah, but it, it costs money for an insurance company to compensate you for flood damage, um, and that means your premiums are going to go up for flood damage, right. and maybe your insurance company may be, not be able to handle it. Sometimes these, these uh, major events, uh, um, break an insurance company's ability to do business, and they and they go out of business, and you don't get you don't get compensated. So I mean, I think right. that's all going to change as the storms increase in intensity and frequency. And so there's not not one solution, but a combination of solutions that we've all got to yeah. attend to personally and as a, as a community. Yeah, and I think, you know, for um, especially for rural areas, it, it really takes community involvement in how you respond to um, these situations. And we, we saw it 
here on Kauai. It was not only the first responders out there, but you had a whole um, a number of community volunteers aiding in the emergency response uh, and, and augmenting um, uh, the emergency response. And, and so there are a lot of qu questions on, on how do you develop this um, community action plan um, to, uh, to afford disaster resiliency. Uh, as, as we move forward. There's a lot of interest in that. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing that happened during um, Tropical Storm Lane was uh, how localized the rainfall was and where we had community members um, in the Waimea area calling the Department of Transportation because of the convoy system in and out calling the Department of Tra Transportation and saying, hey, we have to open up the convoy right now because people want to get home or people want to leave. Mm -hmm. And their response was slow because it wasn't raining in Lehui. They, the, 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 the gauges, because they hadn't, the rain gauges and the stream gauges weren't, I, I guess, weren't calibrated yet um, after the April storm. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, with the local city, you had eyes on the ground experiencing a deluge, you know, it wasn't being recognized where decisions were being made. Mm -hmm. um, and so the response was delayed by like over an hour, um, you know, to get the decision makers to react to the localized situation. Yeah. So, so just again, how do you improve communications? Yeah. How do you engage the, the um, community meaningfully um, in these events and open up and maintain um, communications? Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me is that although the um, in recent storms the neighbor islands seem to get a uh, you know more bad weather, more floods than than Oahu. Um, that, mm -hmm. would be, that, that whole process would be much more destructive. The storms and the floods and the winds could be, if they hit Oahu directly, um, could be much more destructive here. Then the other thing right. I get out of what you're saying, and, and this goes back to the whole thing about um, the insular drift and the drift of region from region mm -hmm. in, in throughout the state, um, you know, fact is, that I, I watched you, Mina, and you were working, roll up your sleeves uh, as, a, as a human person trying to help and trying to get people to help with you uh, to deal with uh -huh. the, the cleanup after the Kauai flood. And I imagine there are a lot of people like that on the Big Island, too. It's an example of old-time Hawaii, maybe the Hawaii we, we left behind in some ways. Uh, but now when yeah. you have a common problem, uh, and people are in trouble, you do roll up your sleeves and everybody chips in to help. And I think Oahu can learn a lot uh, from what has happened on the neighbor islands, what has happened with you and the community or communities uh, in Kauai. So I think we have, to, we have to revisit the whole notion of working together. It's not only taking instructions from the governmental uh, first responders, it's being first responders or at least second responders ourselves and working together to help our neighbors. I think we may have lost some of that, but now is the time to think about it again. Don't you agree? Yeah, I'll tell you one of the most valuable um, actions that the community took was several days after the storm, there were a group of individuals that developed a needs assessment form and they had volunteers go out and get information on people. And, you know, there was another volunteer group that called through the information um, daily to red flag emergency situations, medical care, um, infants, children, those kinds of needs, and respond to them quickly. And so the nonprofit that I was involved with um, 
in order to ensure that the information was being updated uh, consistently, uh, input into a database is done consistently, we took over that and developed a database um, about almost over 500 households were surveyed. And, and so we had information that we could act on and then share with the government agencies. Oh, that's and great. Other that's great. That's fabulous. Well, as an example yeah, so of the, the Hawaii that I truly love, and um, I think mm -hmm. what, what happened in Kauai is, is worth a lot of discussion and it's, it's some great lessons there. And I'm sure we'll find out things that are, happened in the Pig Island the same way. Mina, it's been wonderful to talk to you about this. Uh, uh, and I hope we can get together again in two weeks and explore other things around environment and energy, just as today. Right. Thanks, Jay. I really appreciate you having me. Aloha. Talk soon. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mina. Bye.